Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's session. Um, my name is uh, Brett Purdy, and I'm the Executive Director uh, for Environmental Innovation at Albert Innovates and a former Director of the Water Innovation Program. So this is our seventh webinar in the Water Connect series. And uh, if you've been in here before, you would have seen Vicky hosting um, uh, the previous ones. And uh, Vicky's now on maternity leave. So um, I've taken over um, the, the lead on this for now. So before we begin, uh, let's cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are engagement tools that you can use. Um, all of these tools are resizable and movable. So feel free to move them around to get the most of your uh, desktop space. You can um, expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen uh, by clicking on the arrows uh, in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, uh, you can submit them through the Q&A tool. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webcast. Uh, there's a group chat box. It's a useful tool to connect with the other participants. Um, I'd encourage you to uh, use it to discuss the session topic. Um, certainly don't let it distract you from your presentations and don't use it as the Q&A tool that you want to direct uh, towards the, uh, the speakers today. Uh, for the best viewing experience, we would recommend that you close your other programs or, and uh, your other browsers uh, that might be running in the background that could cause issues. Um, you'll find some additional answers to the common technical issues uh, found in the help uh, uh, tool that's at the bottom of your screen. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Alberta Innovates Water Innovation Connect series, uh, Digital Innovation Meets Water Management. So certainly we all recognize the world is increasingly technical and digital. There's apps for everything, soon to be self-driving cars um, uh, and smart homes and so on. And certainly Alberta has taken steps to uh, be a leader in uh, several of these areas as well. And so in our group, with a focus on digital innovation and clean energy, and well as well as uh, more uh, broad investments in artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, in Alberta today, um, Alberta Innovates has played a role in this space for some time. Today, <clears throat> we'll hear a little more uh, regarding Alberta companies that are working in the digital water innovation space, um, including the development of software systems, AI-based decision tools, <clears throat> sensors, and advanced operations. So today, you'll hear presentations from uh, Jason Copen and Douglas Hallett from ISL Adapt, from Amir Sorabi from Roshan Water Solutions, and from Cam Cote <clears throat> uh, in Telerain. Uh, their bios are available in the engagement tools. Um, a brief uh, little history of Alberta Innovates. So we are a provincial corporation created to support research and innovation activities. Uh, we provide funding programs, advice, connections, technical expertise, and applied research services. Our scope encompasses the whole innovation journey from applied research and development through to commercialization and end use on so knowledge and technologies. Um, and that includes science informing policy and practices. So the Water Innovation Connect series will share ideas and outcomes from projects uh, funded through our Water Innovation Program um, and in the future beyond our program. Um, the Water Innovation Program is designed to help achieve the goals for Alberta's Water for Life strategy and the Alberta's Water Research and Innovation Strategy. So the knowledge and technologies developed in this program will help create a clean tech industry in water treatment, support improvement in water use, conservation, efficiency, productivity, as well as uh, to provide safe, secure, and reliable water resources for a growing population um, while maintaining a focus on aquatic ecosystem health. So I hope this series will provide you with some valuable information and spark discussion. So with that, let's get started in today's session, and I'm going to pass it over to Jason. So Jason Copen and Douglas Hallett will present their findings on ISL ADAPT, optimizing the treatment of drinking water using reinforced learning. So on to you, Jason. Awesome, thank you so much, Brett. And hi everyone, even though I can't see you, uh, it's great that you're here. And um, here's a little brief outline of what uh, Doug and I wanna talk to you about today. And I won't necessarily go through all the bullet points, but the point is we wanna leave you with kind of a story, what this project is all about, the reasoning behind it, and, and kind of what are the next steps and what we're kind of up to uh, with respect to this project. So. Let's, let's start here uh, with the problem. So part of what I do uh, at ISL Engineering, which is the parent company of ISL Adapt, is we do water and wastewater treatment. And uh, that can mean designing large plants. It can mean all sorts of things. And over the years, we were seeing challenges within our, in, within our industry. And, and what those are is like more challenging uh, raw water quality. We're finding more and more stuff in our raw water and there's a lot of great people at a lot of uh, academic institutions doing awesome research on that. Um, the regulatory environment is changing and it's becoming more stringent. Uh, operator challenges with respect to retention are very prevalent. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to retain operators nowadays, especially really good ones that understand uh, treatment at a detailed level. Um, I, want, I often think back to the water cycle and you know it, it's a fact we we have just as much water now as we always have had and we always will have but it's becoming more and more challenging uh, to deal with that and, and brent mentioned this in the introduction about providing safe clean drinking water for generations to come it's going to be harder much harder to do and there's there's more stuff interacting with the other stuff that's in the water and and i'm starting to believe that it's got to be way more complex than linear equations might lead us to think and this is there are definitely cause and effect relationships and, and can we do better? What if we could get some help? <clears throat> you know, excuse me, <clears throat> I often think back to some of the really brilliant operators I've had a chance to work with over the years. And even though we have sets of equations and we have certain design ways we do things and once we bolt together a facility, we set the set points at startup and commissioning and we kind of go from there. If you come back in a few years later, and, and this is where the blessing comes in, is some of these operators, they've taken the dial from where we've originally set it and they've shifted it on parameters. They may not fully understand why, but they get that, you know what, when I tweak this parameter to this point, the water quality is just better. And I have to think they're dealing with some of those complexities without not necessarily fully understanding some of the correlations that may be happening. And some of these awesome operators, they know so much about their system at an intimate level. And not every raw water source is the same. Not every treatment plant is the same. And so can we do better? And one of the, one of the I, I joke because one of the cool operators that I worked with uh, recently was heading into retirement. And I was like, I wish I could download your brain prior to you retiring because you get so much about helping to kind of manage the complexity of the system that's been created for you. And it's this kind of postulating that led me to the birth of uh, this project, and it kind of led to the birth of ISL Adapt. So let's talk a little bit about Drayton Valley, because uh, they're central to this story. And so if you look on the left, you'll see the picture of uh, Drayton Valley's kind of uh, raw water intake, and you'll notice uh, it looks a lot like chocolate milk. And then if you look at the picture on the right, that's the same location, just at a different time of year. And so we would consider the plant at Drayton Valley to be a uh, direct withdrawal. They have a small stilling basin, which you can see in the picture, but for all intents and purposes, they're left to treat whatever's coming at them through the intake. And so they have an ultra, ultra filtration membrane process. And when I look at these pictures specifically, I see a complex system a mix of stable conditions for certain periods and a mix of periods of rapid change. And it's dynamic. And I know for a fact there are many times when the operators don't sleep because uh, they're really concerned about what's happening with the plant. And there's times that they can relax. And that just speaks to the variability in the system. And when you start to layer on what we're learning about climate change and changes in the watershed, uh, you can see that you know the, the challenges of complexity are actually becoming uh, very real. So this is a schematic of Drayton's treatment process. And so here's what we have down the middle are the, are the treatment processes. So I mentioned direct withdrawal off the river. There's a minor flocculation step, uh, then into membrane filtration, disinfection, storage, and, and distribution. But what you see on the right is really the process control regime and how we kind of look at controlling things. Um, you see there's some chemical injection. And then really around the membrane process itself, we're dealing with cleans in place. That's what CIP stands for. Uh, there's a waste reject stream that comes off that. There's backwash processes, blowers. And then in chlorine, of course, we're injecting that into disinfection. And then on the demand side, there's demand, which is based off flow and pressure. And so most of these items here, if you look, it's like time, pressure, and flow. And if I layer on now what we're looking at for analytics, here's the data that we're using. And so on the raw water side, we're looking at you know low uh, levels, pressure flow, uh, turbidity and pH, uh, more for a regulatory point of view rather than process control. And on the membranes itself, we're kind of looking at, in my opinion, a limited range of things. Uh, level pressure flow really within the tanks and particle counting and turbidity relative to uh, regulatory requirements. But not a lot of these things are necessarily talking to each other in the in the process and this is what i would what i would consider sorry a very reactive mode of control so when this parameter gets to this set point the system does this but they're really just trends in it of themselves and and are we really looking at the correlations and how do you get a more predictive control so 
I want to talk a bit about gaps. And so this is my experience. Some may disagree with me, but when you look at what drives designs and um, they're typically driven by regulatory approvals, right? And so in the case of Drayton Valley, there really is two key things we're kind of looking at. One is they have a requirement to treat to a certain turbidity level and they have disinfection requirements that they have to achieve. Um, when we take those and you start working backwards and you design a facility, you have to take into account kind of consumption projections on, on uh, what that's going to do to your facility and you look for opportunities to be able to scale the process. And if you can't necessarily bound that within the current design, you have to make sure you provide some allowances for expandability into the future. In terms of raw water quality, you kind of get a snapshot. Um, you, if, if you're fortunate to do pilot testing, like the case was for Drayton Valley when we designed the facility, um, you get a chance to experiment with kind of the raw water at that time, but are you really looking at the things that you need to make decisions about longer term with respect to that specific pilot? And if you're lucky, you do piloting at the worst time of year when the raw water quality is the most challenging, but then you, if you think back to the pictures of Drayton Valley that I showed you at the start, well, how do you now designed for when it's really clear and you don't have to do so much with the water. In my opinion, this can lead to very conservative designs. And do we give operators the right tools? Are we measuring and controlling what really affects efficiencies? What about the future environment related to climate change and contaminants of emerging concern and all these things we hear about at conferences? You know, have we have we left ourselves tools to be able to do that? And that's kind of hopefully what this project is is starting to address. So when you think now to infrastructure costs, this is a graphic that may be very familiar to a lot of you. And this is a good summation of what municipal infrastructure is at many countries in our world. Um, you've got the capital costs above the water, which is the small tip of the iceberg. And then you've got the O&M costs, which are down below. In the, and uh, really in terms of scale, that's a good representation. O&M by far costs way more than in the capital in the long term. And we put almost 100% of our effort into the part of the iceberg that you see above the water and in terms of design. And yet the bulk of the longer term costs are below, like I said, and does this make sense? And there are many of us out there trying to tackle this issue and bring operational issues into design, but there can be barriers to that. And that's a whole nother, whole nother talk. But you have to wonder, do we even have the right data to be able to make decisions with respect to this? I'm not sure. And then there's a good quote on the bottom, and I believe this is from an American study, but the cost to typically treat water for consumers can be anywhere of 25 to 30% of a municipal budget, and that goes in chemical energy and effort. So there's a lot of room there. When you multiply that across the number of facilities that exist in the number of communities, there's a lot of room to move. So Doug, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, um, as Jason said, uh, I'm working with ISL Adapt and I'm the research innovation lead. So I met Jason back in 2015 and we started thinking about this, this problem set that Jason so well described. And what we're trying to do really at ISL, um, the engineering side of, of, of ISL created this water treatment plant in the Drayton Valley community that you see in the slide. And what we wanted to do was uh, take this project out into the research world. And we were thinking more about automation and control and more specifically about AI. And uh, um, artificial intelligence was kind of sleeping at the time in 2015, but it has since then uh, become very popular in the media. Um, so our, our municipal partner at Drayton Valley, uh, we really needed them to pursue this goal. And so that was our first step was to have a partnership with them uh, to have a facility to do this research. And then we started uh, stepping out into uh, the um, computing science world and we approached the University of Alberta. Um, early on in the project, we worked with people like Chavez Espivari at the bottom of the slide there, um, and also a postdoc of his, Oma Damaki, who currently works at Amy. Um, and then uh, we worked a little bit on, uh, I'll show you a timeline in a minute, but we worked a little bit on some, some modeling and some bench scale tests of, of this complex process that Jason has described. And more, more recently, we've been involved, uh, Martha White at the top of the, the slide on the right there is actually our, our principal investigator in the, in the program that we're running. And Adam White uh, is also a co-PI. And James Bell is their um, research assistant working closely with us on coding. So we have this really powerful lab that we, we started working with quite early on, and we've gone through a number of phases, and I'll, I'll go forward with that. 
Um, so just in the beginning, um, we basically approached uh, University of Alberta's computing science department, met with Chaba. Uh, he had a postdoc, Omid Namaki, and we basically sat back with a, an NSERC Engage grant and uh, used some initial funding to do some simulation and bench scale tests uh, on water treatment. And we looked primarily at the water treatment process of filtration or ultrafiltration, which was the, the type of uh, treatment being used in Drayton Valley. Now, um, Oma and Omid and Chaba, they, we st also started working on results at the very end of these two interactions, and they were quite uh, prominent in, in writing a, an NSERT collaborative research grant uh, with ISL, uh, which later became ISL Adapt. Um, and we wanted to focus and develop some of the IP that we started to develop with them. Uh, more recently, as I said, Martha White in the center of the, the slide uh, uh, on the left and Adam White on the left uh, became PIs of the project. Uh, Chaba actually moved on to London to work uh, with Google DeepMind for a little while in 2017 and 2019. And uh, Adam uh, joined a little later after Martha, uh, and they are both um, uh, and CIFAR chairs in, in artificial intelligence, and also uh, Adam himself uh, is associated with DeepMind in Edmonton. Um, Omid, uh, our postdoc, moved on to Amy to work, and he's also joined by Anna Coop in the picture. And more recently, again, James Bell, who you see on the right, uh, standing beside Jason, looking at the actual pilot system. Now, just as a bit of a timeline to re revamp what I was saying earlier, uh, Martha's uh, uh, reinforcement learning AI team, they are set to use this uh, full-scale um, uh, water treatment data. They basically had about three years of data that they worked with uh, from about uh, 2018 uh, to look at algorithm development and exploration of the water treatment challenges that Jason described. So using things like the sensors available, the type of control philosophy, the PIDs, uh, in the in the architecture of the of the equipment, the OEM equipment, um, and then of course more importantly uh, for doing this work, we needed to approach funding agents. And Albert Innovates was one of the first people we approached along with NSERC, and we needed them to help us uh, to create this pilot system. Um, and on on the grant uh, side of things, it's a lot of a lot of conversations, a lot of talk, uh, and a lot of obviously delays through time uh, with the pandemic more recently. But on this timeline, we're now at a point uh, after working on uh, the bench scale system and some modeling, we have the pilot installed in the plant, and we're actively uh, pursuing our reinforcement learning objectives. Just to reiterate a little bit on the bench scale system. Uh, we had some key results I just want to point out to you. One is uh, about a 4 to 20% energy savings on the bench scale system operations. Uh, this is a system embedded within the University of Alberta that we had access to. It uses a flat membrane surface, and the energy savings that we, we found on the operations of this unit were actually quite encouraging and were the driving force behind a lot of the the uh, um, research funding that we were pursuing at a higher level for the pilot. Um, most importantly, we were dealing with model-based RL, and the models that we were using were based on uh, publications that, that uh, used um, models from first principles. We found out, though, that reinforcement learning actually works better in a model-free environment, and that's a little bit uh, esoteric, but I'll describe that more in a minute. So back in 2016, um, most of you may have known that um, uh, DeepMind, uh, owned by Google, advanced a, a game, basically uh, an AI-based uh, player of a game called AlphaGo that raised worldwide attention uh, using deep learning techniques. And it actually was very good at sequential decision-making, planning, and control. Uh, we basically uh, saw this in 2016 as we were starting a research project, got very excited. Uh, this RL uh, agent that plays this game of Go reaches actual, actual superhuman performance and beat the world's best Go and chess champions. So when we were sitting at ISL Adapt, we thought, well, we, we would like to uh, use this type of technology in controlling the water treatment facilities that we have. More recent advances by Google DeepMind have been cooling data centers uh, that, that are, of course, house lots of complicated equipment, uh, protein folding in the health, health spheres, finance, and robotics. Um, our project sits basically at an interface between um, computing science and engineering. And again, we're focusing on the control aspect of, of reinforcement learning. And in, in a nutshell, this is an AI for good in water engineering and control. 
Just to give you a little background on reinforcement learning, uh, basically we have the environment, which is the pilot system you see in the picture below. Uh, this is a full scale ver or a small scale version of the entire water treatment facility at Drayton Valley. Um, and the computer above is our agent or learning agent, our RL computer. Uh, what separates reinforcement learning from other types of machine learning or AI is that it works on rewards and feedback from the environment. And that agent can actually take actions and control things within the mini plant. And uh, it can't do that without observations. It needs a lot of data. And Jason described some of those data observations that we have already. It's a rich field to, to investigate and the researchers were quite excited uh, to advance with us. Um, so really this is a, this is a project in, in advanced control. And we have learning agents that are pointed at many complex processes uh, via the sensor data. Um, some are actively controlling, uh, while others are just watching and determining very optimal policies for control. The agents in our RL system don't do anything until they have a, a, a proper uh, policy uh, to evaluate actions that they take. Uh, so any adjustments in, say, pH or temperature, backwash settings, all these interactions are being logged in deep learning networks. And then uh, nothing will be done until these deep learning networks actually give us uh, insight into the system. And in many cases, we get insights that are, uh, are, are beyond human recognition. And Jason des described earlier about downloading an operator's brain. Well, we're trying to create an operator's brain with our observations here. The pilot unit itself, uh, back to Jason, I want to get him to describe some of the, the nuts and bolts of this. You bet. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so this is our baby. Uh, this is what's installed in, in Drayton Valley. This is our playground. Uh, not a lot of folks have access to something like this for testing model free process control, um, which is installed and fully operational, at, like Doug said, as, as of August uh, this year. We've got two skids. One's the flocculation and pretreatment skid, which you see on the left, and then the membrane skid on the right. And again, it's the same exact membranes that we're using in the main treatment uh, process. Uh, fully scalable to the main plant, but it's not your typical pilot unit. Um, it is fully tricked out with way more analytics, uh, so you can get way more data. And this was a customized design we did with Suez Water Technologies out of Ontario. So what does it look like? Here's how we Here's how we integrated it into the main plants. So we pull our feed really off the flocculation line upstream of any sort of chemical injection. And again, it matches the same processes on the, uh, on the main plant. I do admit I forgot to put in CIP relative to the pilot unit, but it is there. Um, both the permeate stream uh, and the waste stream are combined together at one point and rejected. Nobody's drinking the water that comes from this, which allows us to uh, play around with it a little bit. Um, we have basically the same chemicals. Uh, we did provide for more injection points and we can experiment a little bit more uh, with different types of chemicals on this unit. So the key thing is what are we doing uh, about data? So this, this is gonna analyze what's, what's happening with that. So if we flip here, here's all the data points that we're actually looking at. And if you think back to the similar slide that I had for the main plant, there's way more focus on water chemistry uh, on the raw water side and then in and around the membrane process itself. These are the things that principally affect efficiency of the treatment process and so, it behooves us to really start to dig into what, what those are and, and to look at those effects. And so you can see things like we're looking at conductivity UVT. Now we've added in on the raw water side. Um, for the membrane itself, of course, we're looking upstream uh, when it comes from the flock tank, looking at conductivity UVT again. Uh, for the permeate, conductivity, UVT, uh, temp pressure flow, those sorts of things. And then the, the really cool one here is on the waste reject stream is we're looking at those uh, stuff and that's shown on the right. So pH, turbidity, conductivity, UVT, et cetera. So we really want to understand as that water is processed by the membrane unit, where are certain things going and what's happening to them and uh, to help us figure that out. And of course, on top of this now, this is a big key difference is we've got the RL system as uh, Doug described, and this is actually using now the relationships between all these. So prior to that, we weren't necessarily looking for uh, connections between the data streams. Now we are, um, there you go. So uh, trying to get a more reactive mode of process control that would have been typical in the past. So. Um, 
I think we're in a really unique position with this project and we understand um, that there's many plants that exist out there and, and how they're put together. And we want to keep that in mind when we're developing the algorithms and what we want to get out of them. So scalability between the pilot and the existing plant for that matter is very important. And I want to stress this is not about algorithms making autonomous decisions about water treatment uh, for us human operators are still very central to all of this and i'm a huge champion of the operators that are out there um, it's all about helping operators make informed proactive decisions about water treatment that balance efficiencies and water quality and this project has everything to do with building trust there are lots of people who may say ai and the robots and skynet and all that sort of stuff but for us this is a lot about building trust and i have a hard time thinking about a better way to do that than when this with this living lab and the playground uh, that we have working in tandem uh, with real plant uh, with big brother kind of doing treatment and watching and learning and to see if there's any ways we can do better things so um scaling and testing is very important and so we're looking at you know the key three things are on the screen which is the rl algorithms definitely creating the learning environment for the rl system to work and then we're constantly thinking about ways uh that we can look at scaling that up to uh the main plant so a few closing thoughts about uh, things we're really looking forward to, and we have learned a ton in the last little bit about how we employ the learning agents on the pilot system and what that does. Um, we're learning a great deal about how to handle big data, and as Doug was saying, data is huge, very important, but with big data comes big noise, and you have to think about how you filter that out and how you make good, keen decisions. Um, we've also figured a lot about OEM code and control architecture and, and thinking back to some of the ways that we conventionally design treatment systems, there can be some barriers that you have to overcome with that, but it's, it's fun to try to figure these things out. Uh, as we keep going, of course, energy targets for pumping and for UF filtration actions are there and it makes a good business sense. We've already found some low hanging fruit uh, that we think we can go after and get some quick wins uh, with respect to improving efficiency already. Um, we're really excited about model free implementation uh, that's coming now as we continue to forge, develop, test, and iterate our testing program. Um, we really look forward this year to being able to apply what we're learning to the main plant. And that's uh, really, we're gonna be making suggestions. Everything still has to go through operations, but it's about making informed decisions, not just saying the number needs to be tweaked to this or the set point needs to be tweaked to this, but give us the reasoning why. And we're designing the system to be able to do that. Um, of course, we're continuing to work on commercialization. That's a big part of the Made in Alberta solution that this project is kind of built around. And I do wanna give a shout out to the very fantastic operators in Drayton Valley and the other project partners here from U of A and Amy that we're so blessed to work with and I'm learning so much from. Doug. Okay, just to end off, just want to say that we have some exciting times ahead and, and a shout out again to the pilot project partners, the Reinforcement Learning AI Lab at the University of Alberta, Drayton Valley, and also the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Uh, we have worked with these folks for the last few years and enjoy it so much. And we can't, we couldn't do any of this research, of course, without funding uh, from NSERC uh, through the research, uh, collaborative research grant. And also, of course, our hosts here, Alberta Innovates in the Water Innovation Program. They are instrumental in funding the pilot and keeping this project live and, and uh, real in Alberta. And we're looking forward to sharing more with you in the future. The last thing we'd like to mention is that we also have provincial help uh, through the way of the water regulator for Alberta, and that's Lyndon Gyrix. We just want to give out a shout to Lyndon. He's been uh, in the behind the scenes a little bit, but of course, as Jason said earlier, regulations drive water treatment. So uh, we will be walking hand in hand with the province on this whole AI pathway. So thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Douglas. Uh, thank you, Jason. And so with that, uh, we're gonna move over to uh, Amir. So Amir Sarabi uh, will present uh, findings from Roshan Water Solutions on uh, rapid testing of water samples for E. coli and total uh, coliform. So um, Amir, I'll hand the uh, mic over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Brett. <clears throat> Excuse me, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be here as, as part of this an awesome panel talking about dig digital water and digital innovation in the water systems. And I'm really happy, first of all, that my presentation kind of scheduled at a second because I can really pick up what Jason and Docos were talking about in the previous presentation. 
and uh, with more focus on the microbiological test uh, data points. So what I want to do with uh, for this presentation is um, I want to lay out how our water work system, especially on the municipal side, uh, sort of work in Alberta. And what are the historic data that we have from them? And what are the gaps in the data that we have or the way that we use the data? So let me start uh, the presentation with this uh, sort of quote. Uh, digit, uh, global water intelligence uh, basically put together a series of uh, webinars uh, from August to November. And it was all about how digital transformation is helping or coming into play into the municipalities and the water work. So one of the panelists a couple of months ago said a sentence that kind of stuck to us, which was data is becoming an important asset for municipalities. And as just Douglas and Jason were talking about, it's all about data and how we can use data to control processes to make more important decisions. And actually what Jason said, kind of what's what you're saying right now, how we can help um, our municipal operators to use more real-time data uh, for the processes for making decisions. So what we wondered uh, was what type of data our municipalities, especially in Alberta, are generating right now, especially on the testing side. And by that, I mean all sorts of testing that they do to make sure the water is safe and uh, to drink for, for the residents. And before answering that question, something else has actually came to our mind, and it was how our water work systems operate in general. So that's what I said. I want to lay out how they work and what are the test data that we have from them and how we can progress and move ahead and be more advanced. So um, basically, Alberta's drinking water structure, uh, it's a, like everywhere else, it's very complicated. There are many, many, many other, many, many players from the uh, provincial government, federal government, um, municipalities, organizations are involved in them. But if I want to sum it up uh, as is the general categories, we have regulated uh, water work systems and unregulated. Um, the regulated water work systems are responsible for 87% of uh, population. So they serve almost 87% of the population in Alberta. And they include all the cities like Edmonton and Calgary, all the towns like Dayton Valley and all the smaller villages that are connected to the water work system. These water work systems, as the name says, are regulated. So they have a governance system on top of them. And that governance system is a complicated combination of Alberta environments and parks, uh, providing them with license to operate and specifically saying different parameters that they have to measure and make sure that uh, they, they stick to that parameters. So, and the municipality uh, themselves have a team of operators, a utility manager that basically their job, day-to-day -day job is making sure the water is in our pipes and the water is safe to drink. So they do a lot of work every day to make sure that that happens for us. On the other side, we have unregulated ones, which are only 13% of Albertans. Um, and they are mostly uh, wells, private wells, private tankers, private cisterns. So these are unregulated, meaning that uh, Alberta Environment and Parks doesn't regulate them, doesn't oversee them. And they only provide recommendations on how to um, manage these water systems. But it's the sole responsibility of the owner of the house or owner of that water uh, well to make sure the water is safe to drink, to test it, and send the samples to the lab and make sure that they can drink the water. So that's basically a very overall overview of what we have in Alberta. So having to, uh, understanding that, we actually went uh, to find out what sort of data that our municipalities are generating right now. So thank God Alberta Environment and Parks has a very good database. Uh, it's kind of looked like this. Uh, in, in the middle of the page, you see a place that you can type a community name that can be a name of the city, name of the town, uh, municipal district, uh, anything. And you can go, actually go and see who holds the approval for that the water works or what are the water work systems in that specific location, what are, who are the approval holders. And you can see all sorts of data about their tests and uh, reports on different things. Everything that you want, we wanted to see was actually in here in this database. So we actually got our team uh, to go inside this database and do a data mining, uh, which kind of looks like an Excel sheet right now like this, which is a giant one. Uh, but uh, it basically has the name of the place, the name of the county, their population, but more importantly, what are the name of the water work system there and who holds the approval for them. 
And after that, we actually looked more detailed into the microbiological test, which is going to be the focus of the rest of the slides that are coming through. So what we did was actually, so we focused on the regulated water work systems, and uh, we only focused on population centers uh, with population more than 5,000. And why we chose that number, it's a separate conversation we can have, but uh, in a gist, it came out of our market assessment we did a couple of years ago with WaterNex down in Calgary. So we set our site as a potential target customer on population centers in Alberta and overall investor Canada that, has, that have population more than 5,000. So anyway, with that uh, two criteria, we found out that we have about 36 municipalities and basically that have that population in Alberta, and they are cities, counties, and municipal districts. In these 36 municipalities, uh, we found 428 water work systems. And these 428 wa water work systems, they have about 300 different approval holders. Now, this is the place that uh, everything gets complicated because these approval holders can be cities, can be towns, can be counties, uh, and can be private entities such as co-ops or uh, private resorts or golf courses, for example, that hold the approval. So these are the very general information that we got from the beginning. Then we looked into the, basically the test reports that they have and what sort of tests they do. And we realized that there is a general theme to all these test reports. Basically, all water work systems, they have standards and they have uh, required test reports based on the water work license that Alberta Parks and Environments provide them with. But when you look at the test data, all systems must perform microbiological tests, or as the operators call it, back tests. And these microbiological tests are done at the treatment unit and more, more importantly, in the distribution system. And I'll get into how they are doing it right now uh, in a few slides, but uh, this is the test that every municipality, every approval holder has to do. And you can basically understand why it is important because the presence of the bacteria in our water work that goes through the pipe can easily turn into an outbreak that we had uh, 20 years ago in Waterton, Ontario, Walkerton, Ontario. So that is something that has to happen and we have to make sure, the operators have to make sure that there is no bacteria in their water systems. Out of 428 water work system, the systems that uh, I mentioned, I talked about, uh, about 286 of them only do microbiological tests because it's absolutely must. And uh, sorry, 286 do actually a little bit more than that. They actually also measure residual chlorine, which is a sort of a proxy for making sure the, the sanitary condition of the water work system. But there are only a very handful of um, municipalities that do a lot more tests. And those are like um, Scriptosporidium, GRDL, viruses, stuff like that. And usually these are larger municipalities like Edmonton and Calgary who have the facilities they usually have um, on-site labs or they have close proximity labs, and they have a huge operation team on their side to help them with these systems. So the conclusion of this slide is all municipalities, all approval holders have to do microbiological tests. The frequency of these tests, the microbiological test, uh, depends on the population and their license. That was one of the things that we actually looked into to find out what is the monthly test uh, for each of these approval holders that um, I'll be more than happy to share with uh, every, um, people who are interested after this presentation. But let's talk about uh, microbiological tests. There can be a ton of different microbes and stuff in our water that can make us sick, all sort of microbiological entities. But the good news in all of that is we really don't need, or our operators don't need to go out and test for all those stuff. The global standard is to test for two indicators, total coliform and E. coli. So they represent the indicator because their presence, especially total coliform, can show uh, the presence of other bacteria. And the presence of the E. coli in the water shows a, a potential contamination with feces in the water. So these are the important two indicators that all municipalities send samples to for testing. And they are tested for these two uh, all around the world. And it's not something that is um, local to Alberta or Canada. It's a global standard. How they do it right now? Well, the operator's job, uh, one, one of their tasks 
on, in a week is to go out into the distribution system and the water treatment unit. They will get samples uh, and they'll basically send it to a lab. And that happens usually through health units uh, of their local facilities or they send it directly to a lab. And for the lab, it takes a few days usually to get back the results. If you are in a big city like Edmonton or Calgary, usually they will get the results 24 hours later. But in the smaller community, communities that we have been in touch with and have been talking to, such as Yellowhead County, even Drayton Valley, they usually get their results a few days later. And Yellowhead County usually gets the results five days later. What I want to say here is they are doing the tests now, but it's not a real-time data that they can rely on. And when we actually talk to these operators, I think Jason, Jason was mentioning this at the beginning of this pres his presentation, that they do have that worry that uh, how, we can, how can we control and make sure that drinking water is safe while we are getting the bacterial test results a few days later. And uh, it's, it's actually a nightmare for some of them. You can imagine that they are getting a sample today, that the water is running to the transport to the distribution system for a few days, but after a few days, they will get, get to know if the water was safe or not. So that was one of the big hole overall in the current microbiological testing protocol that we have right now. So considering this, we looked into the data for the, uh, the Alberta and we found out that our municipalities that I talked to, uh, I talked about, and they did about 3,204 tests in September of 2020, uh, only microbiological tests. And out of those tests, normally only 0.3% of the test results comes back positive with total coliform. So about, let's say 10 cases per month uh, over in Alberta. And out of those 10 cases, there is a very small chance that E. coli is present, which is only 5%. That basically shows that our water work systems are good. We are not, we don't need to worry that there is something like right now, a problem in our water. It means that our operators are doing their job fantastically, making sure the water that we drink is safe. But what I want to show is actually this. We looked into the distribution of total coliform test results that are positive over the past few years. And what we, what we realized is uh, there are years like 2011 that the numbers are higher than usual, but you can see that even 2020, we had 34 test results. And bear in mind that uh, in 2020, we haven't had all the results coming. The database of Alberta Parks and Environment is usually a quarter behind. So we only have until the end of September the test results. And the, basically after that, which can be a problem for a lot of municipalities in the winter time, we haven't had that data in. So what, all I want to say is we don't have huge issues in our water work system. Give, I'll give that to the operators and our water work system, but our water work systems are not fully immune. And it's really hard to make sure that there is no cases. It's more important to find out if there is a case of uh, bacterial contamination in the water work system and how we can treat it right away. Also, I wanted to show the number of positive total coliform tests um, since 2013, the 23, 2003, sorry, uh, overall for different municipalities that we looked into. And you can imagine, you can see that some of these municipalities, like Rocky View County, has much higher number. And there can be a multitude of different results. Um, they, like Rocky View County is our largest county probably in Alberta, and they cover a large area. And they also include Calgary, Calgary Water Works System, which is by itself is a huge water work system. And um, it can be aging for infrastructure for some of these municipalities. Um, some of these municipalities are actually, they, they are in areas that are prone to seasonal floods. And this is actually one of the very interesting um, data points that we can look into in future and see if there's a trend in places that get flooding over years and increase or jump in the coliform results. But also we realized that uh, it's some, to some extent it's, an, the, it's a factor or it's a, it's a factor of number of the tests performed per month. And what do I mean by that is when we actually plotted the number of the back T tests that they do per month, uh, each municipality versus the number of positive total coliform that they have had, that you can see almost a trend that bigger cities, bigger places like Edmonton and Calgary, they cover a huge space. They do a lot more tests uh, compared to smaller municipalities, and they tend to find more problem in their system because they're testing more and they're testing more in different places. 
So that's potentially uh, another another point that if we do more tests, if we have a system to do more tests for us, it can help us to find more problems or actually know about more problems in our system that we currently don't know. And that can be a, a sort of a potential issue for smaller municipalities that they don't have uh, enough uh, capacity to run a lot of tests right now because they have to send samples to central labs, which doesn't make sense to do it right now. And the final thing on the historic data I wanted to show is actually this. And uh, so we, we actually found pretty interesting data from different places like Alcomdale Waterworks System that had a huge spike of test result positive for the from 2011. And we wondered why that happened. We actually got the answer yesterday when we were talking to the Sturgeon County um, the, the manager of the utilities there. So it turned out that in 2011, Alcom Dale Waterworks system was actually on private on wells. They didn't have a good treatment unit and they didn't have a trained operator system to actually do the samples. So, so all of those issues resulted in having larger numbers. Thank God Alcom Dale now is part of the Sturgeon County Waterworks system and they do get a lot better water quality right now. So I'll set, I said all of these because uh, right now we believe it's not data that is important asset to municipalities, actually it's data management. It doesn't matter if we have the data. Uh, what is important is we have real-time data and we have tools that can tell us that the data is useful or not, or what is the problem with data. We don't need a database that just basically parks the data in there for nobody to use. So what we are talking about all is about database decision making. And why I'm saying this is because I'm going to make a gateway to what we do right now. I'm going to bring up again how the current testing of microbiological samples are, are done. So getting samples from distribution systems, sending it to a lab, waiting for the results to come back. The, the red sort of circles I made, there are the places that the data is made in the municipality in this process. Uh, the first data that is made is from the sample. So operators usually have a chain of custody, which is shockingly a paper form that they to have to fill in. And that information includes time of sampling, location of sampling. And those are important parameters, especially time, because microbiological samples have a very short window to be tested. And if that window is passed, the sample is rejected by the lab. We have had a lot of our operators saying that they had mistakes in that chain of custody, manual error mistakes, human errors that has caused this uh, sample rejection because of that little mistake in the time of the sampling or the data of the sample. The second place that the data is generated in the process, obviously, is the test results, which is right now, as I said before, many, many times, it's just not real-time data. It takes a few days to get the data. And finally, it's the communication of the, that test data from the lab to the municipality, which usually happens through email right now. And they will get a PDF with numbers on it and nothing else. So what we do, our product is called VeloSense. So it's a portable device, first of all, uh, for testing total coliform and e, e. coli. And so by nature of being portable, it allows testing to happen anywhere. The process you are creating to test samples is so easy that anybody can use it. It doesn't need a huge training. But the most important feature in the whole process is to actually test water samples in one hour. So you can imagine one hour where uh, the, compared to at least 24 hours, at least 24 times faster time and faster in getting the results. So what does it mean for the municipalities is they can test the samples right there and find out if their water is contaminated with bacteria right now, as opposed to a few days later. But what we actually ended up also including in the product package, uh, we were originally a hardware company um, by nature and it's our core still. But we also have created a smart sampling tool for the operators, which is barcoded um, bottles that they take samples from. With the simple scan of that barcode, we get all the information that we have to get or they have to uh, have about the time, location, the person who's doing the sample, everything with a simple barcode. There is no error in that. There is no way that the date can, can, can uh, be stored wrong. So we, we, we do that to make sure that always they get the, the data that they need. And finally, we send all that data from the sample and our test results to our cloud data center. There in the cloud data center, they can see all the test results that they can do right now in the uh, Alberta uh, Environmental Park uh, website. 
but our grand vision is actually providing these municipalities with their map. On the map, they can see the, all the locations they have done the tests, all the locations that the tests were positive and more important, sorry, negative and more importantly positive. But they also can see the distribution of the tests. And if there is a place on their map that they haven't got the samples from enough to make sure that that, that location, that specific region in their municipalities is uh, drinking water safe. So that is our grand vision, to allow them to make decisions based on real-time data. Uh, and that's what we are doing. And when we sit in with municipalities to talk about this, uh, it's heartwarming to hear everything that we want to tell them when they tell us those stuff. Like we want a real-time data, we think we are not doing it well right now. And uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that with all the support that we have from Alberta Innovates, and every other entities in Alberta, we can make this real-time data-based decision-making and happen for our municipalities. So with that, um, I'm finishing, um, I would like to finish this presentation. And again, thank you to Brett and Alberta Innovates Water Innovation Program for supporting this project and supporting us in the past year and a half almost. Thank you. OK, um, thank you, Amir. All right, um, so just ready to pass it on then. So Cam, um, just I, I see in the group chat, you indicated that you were having a connection problem and we're gonna reconnect. Hopefully you're, uh, you, you've you done that already and are, are ready to connect. So I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Cam Cote, um, who will present findings <clears throat> on Intel IntelliRain, a system engineering approach for precision irrigation. So Cam, let's uh, pass it over to you. Okay, looks like Cam is frozen right now. So if I don't hear anything from him, um, while I'm waiting for him to interject and interrupt me, what I might do is uh, just ask uh, one of the questions here. And so uh, Amir, since uh, you were up most recently, I'll, I'll just pass uh, one on to you. Um, and, and I understand uh, just from, from some of the work that you've submitted to us that, that you're, you're addressing this issue. So um, question, are, are you considering false positive rate in your analysis for uh, coliform positive uh, tests? Um, and you could say the same for the E. coli and how you're addressing that issue. Uh, that's a very good question. And I don't know if you can see uh, my background, but uh, we are doing a test, a standard test based on uh, one of the ISO standards. So let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, the regulatory approval in the testing in the bacteria testing environment, uh, the the approval process is done by US EPA, so United States Environmental Protection Agency, and then that passes on, and you can take that and take to municipalities for uh, their final legislation. What we do right now is using one ISO standard that is uh, prescribed by US EPA to use to find all that information, which we call performance characteristics. And those characteristics are sensitivity, selectivity, false positive, false negative, and everything else. So we have done uh, one round of those tests earlier this year before COVID happened. We had a little bit higher false positive than we wanted to have. We adjusted our reagents. We did, we, did, we did a huge research on what to do. And if you see my background, we actually started doing the test recently. And, and the test went until 3 a.m. this morning, actually, the first round. So we are working on that to lower down for, and that uh, false positive. OK, um, thank you, Amir. So I'll just uh, see if Cam's uh, connection is uh, working better again. And maybe we can uh, pass over to Cam. So sound check, are you on, Cam? Yeah, it's Cam here. Do you hear me? Yeah, you're coming through fine. All right, so I'll uh, pass over control um, and the mic to you, and you can uh, take off uh, with your section here, okay? Perfect. Uh, thanks, Brett, and thanks to everybody at Alberta Innovates for putting these water innovation sessions on. I know 2020 hasn't been the... Uh, the year that any of us want, but it's great to see all this innovation that's still continuing and all the great things that are happening in Alberta. And we're just really honored to be part of this uh, presentation. So I'm Cam Cody, founder of Intellarain. And today uh, we'll talk about the importance of our work to Alberta, 
Uh, our first commercialization product, our sprinkler, our advanced control system, and how we're going to fit that into the agricultural market, uh, best watering practices, the challenges we faced, a new exciting wireless communication protocol called LoRa, and our future work. Alberta is the second largest agricultural producer in Canada. Uh, we have 1.8 million acres of irrigated land right now. And as I'm sure a number of you uh, know, Alberta has just committed another $800 million to increasing our infrastructure for irrigated land to improve it and increase it. As we increase this land, it's going to be more and more important uh, that we use this water as, efficient, as efficiently as we can. And water conservation uh, is coming to a forefront. Uh, combined with that, and I guess COVID's brought this up, is food security, uh, the ability to make and grow more food uh, is going to be very important, not only because of COVID, uh, but the growing world population. Our first product uh, that we've commercialized uh, is a turf in-ground irrigation sprinkler. It's fully robotic. It brings 2020 technology into a world where our competitors are dealing with uh, technology that was designed in the 1950s and 1960s when water conservation hadn't even been thought of. Um, they all use uh, local municipal water sources and irrigation was in its infancy. I don't think anybody saw what a big industry would become. And again, I guess global warming, we have all these different uh, world issues uh, driving these separate issues, uh, but we're seeing more and more land irrigated because of the change in climate. Also, we're seeing different types of water now used in irrigation. Uh, we'll use reclaimed pond uh, as well as municipal source, which causes other issues with sprinklers. And so our sprinkler was designed to work with any type of water uh, and we can work with waters that that are not 100% clean. We keep all our drivetrain out of the uh, water pathway. So it allows us to use non-potable water, which is where a lot of the world is moving for irrigation. Our system is fully robotic. We control where the head is, how quick it rotates and the flow per degree. By bringing this type of control in, we have managed to be 30% more efficient as tested by Olds College here in Alberta. So 30% the efficiency difference on that, we measure it in distribution uniformity in irrigation. So that's how evenly we put the water out throughout the prescribed watering area. So from the end of throw all the way back to the head, it's important we put this water down evenly so we don't get wet and dry spots. That way we put it, we can use the least amount of water to hit the prescribed soil moisture rate at plant level that we're looking for. The design is very scalable and it's a robust system that can be used in many different markets. Uh, our product is currently used on sports fields, large municipal parks, golf courses, as well as dewatering projects. Now that we had a control device that, or a, a sprinkler that could function in all these different environments, it was very important to create a control system that allowed the operator to easily use the sprinkler and take advantage of all the many benefits. We've come up and worked with the uh, researchers at the University of Alberta, and they developed a geospatial driven app for our system that allows the operator to easily input and use the tablet. You simply download our app onto an existing tablet connect through Wi-Fi to the internet, be it through a local connection or a hotspot off the phone, if you're in a field condition. It will download the Google Earth image, as you see in this diagram, locate the sprinkler head in its correct GPS location, and then you can just simply draw and apply your prescribed watering area. 
So rather than conventional irrigation, where we're working on circles and parts of circles, being robotic, we have complete control and we can water whichever shape we want. On this example you see here on the screen, uh, we use pins. So we can drop a number of pins around the area and then through the toggles on the center right, we can move each pin to a line and create the exact pattern we want. Uh, if we're looking uh, for other patterns, we can simply draw, just drag your finger around the tablet and draw what you're looking for, uh, the shape you want. The other advantage with IntelliRing, because we can do very complicated shapes, we require a lot less sprinklers. On this instance here, uh, one sprinkler will water this green on one pattern, and then we can turn it around to water the surround area on a different pattern as they are different turf types and the operator would want to water them differently. Typically in this area, this one head would replace six standard irrigation heads, which adds again to ease of install and greater efficiency. By having this app, we get a, a seamless, easy to use marketability product. This app is capable of running from one head, a single head in a location just to fix a trouble spot to an entire golf course. So it's extremely scalable and allows, again, the operator to use the, to make the technology very easy to use. We have multiple installations and some of them up to 1.6 kilometers away. So it's very important to have an app that's easy and can cover large areas. The next question that came in our research, we saw that we could save 30% water with a more efficient watering device. And we believe that's the, only the first part of the equation on what we're looking to do. The next question is, when and how much should you water? In irrigation, uh, if you know, you're doing uh, municipal watering, you'll hear city of Calgary, city of Edmonton, we'll talk flip of uh, Frisbee upside down. When it's full, you've got your watering level for a week. Uh, this is very old school thinking. The thought is the Frisbee is about one inch and everybody looks at a evapotranspiration rate of approximately one inch per week. This is right only very few times in the year and adds a lot of times to very substantial overwatering of soil. So then we looked at well, how can we do this? You know, what kind of device can we, can we create? And we looked at soil moisture sensors, uh, which is a predominant uh, item you'll see on a lot of fields now, they'll, they'll take information from a soil moisture sensor. The problem that comes into that is when we look at a field, be it you know a quarter section for agriculture or even a sports field, we have all these different zones. We'll have different soil types. We'll have topography. Uh, the layering of the geotech underneath with the clays will all affect the moisture level at plant root level. So how do we get around this? One way is additional moisture sensors. As we got into this, we learned that the, the, we improve exponentially as we increase the number of moisture sensors, but we get to a point where it is not scalable and not possible. So we are designing a non-contact moisture sensor that will mount either to a lawnmower for parks or golf course or to the central pivot in agricultural irrigation that will take real-time information will scan the field run it through a predictive model control unit and then model the the existing moisture level at root level of plant throughout the field and then come out with a watering prescription or schedule to do that so we started with ag, agriculture, 70% of all water used is used by agriculture as well. Mo the typical pivot does a quarter section of land and is 400 meters long. 
and will consist of approximately 100 water nozzles spread out across that 400 meters. So it's a very large area. Uh, we'll typically always have topography. Um, very rare do we see a field that's completely flat. And even when we see that, the geotech will come into play and cause issues uh, within that that we do not get uh, even water across field. So it was very important that we had a technology that could learn, process, and optimize pivot watering automatically. The reason for this, when we're looking at a quarter section of land, 100 nozzles, it is impossible for anyone to go out and take enough moisture sensor readings on a daily basis and then come back and write a prescription for each of those nozzles for each two degrees of rotation throughout the field. So it had to be a very scalable solution. It had to be an automated solution. We weren't just going to create a sensor to create data and then pass it on for someone else to process. We felt it was very important that we had onboard processing and process this data in real time as if pivot goes across the field to update and correctly water the field. So this is a before simulation. Um, we've done a testing now for two years. Uh, we've started testing down at the uh, Lethbridge Pivot Research Center and had great results, preliminary results, and we'll actually go into the field uh, here this spring. So here what we're looking at, we'll see this field. We have, and this is very common to all the different fields we've scanned, we'll have some dry spots where we're going to, where we're entering into the wilting level of the plant or the crop. Once we do that, we've stressed it and it's going to be very hard for that to recover. We're going to affect yield and quality of the crop. Conversely, we'll see other areas where we're too wet. And again, we're going to affect yield and productivity. So here, after the model learns and it starts to make real-time adjustments, we can equalize the soil moisture. Now you're looking at this saying this doesn't look equalized. We need to look at each slice of the pie. This pivot is rotating counterclockwise. The red area is where we've just put down water, so we'll show very high uh, for a few hours until it reaches plant root level, which is where we're sensing. So you can see as we're starting to enter into the irrigation process, this moisture level will be above the wilting level, but at the lower of the preferred moisture level for the crop we've indicated. So we'll start to come and bring that moisture level up. And as we come around, uh, and we're talking days here, uh, this pivot will be set for two, three, four day rotation speed depending on the amount of precipitation we want to put down on each pass. So you can see if we take it and look at each of the little two degree pie shapes, for each of those, we have a very consistent moisture level. We've gotten rid of the problem from the previous slide. And as we come around, we'll add to that to maintain the correct moisture level for the plants. So by doing this, with our sensor, we create within this 400 meter pivot, 18,000 virtual moisture sensors throughout this field. So we feed the information from these 18,000 information points into the model and then relate that back to runtime for each of the 100 models across the length of the pivot. So we will be putting this into production. We are looking at uh, the initial launch will be three different pivots, three different crops uh, in Southern Alberta starting this spring and very excited to bring this technology to the market. Challenges. Our biggest challenge has been with communication, reliable long distance communication. Uh, we get an extra, I think, challenge with irrigation and our product being uh, in ground. 
As soon as we, Wi-Fi was the typical default communication mode. As soon as Wi-Fi gets anywhere near the ground, the ground just sucks it up and the communication is very poor, very inconsistent. So we looked at what can we, uh, you know, where can we go with this as we were not happy and didn't have a stable connection. Uh, after a lot of research, we've gone to LoRa. LoRa is a new emerging protocol that we are working with now. It's an important, very important piece that we can advance and scale our products. It's not complete. Uh, LoRa is, in its infancy, we've had to do a lot of research with our group at the University of Alberta. Uh, we've had to create our own router. A LoRa router did not exist. Um, we'll be the first one to bring one to market so that we can have all our different devices talk to each other, whether it's the 100 sprinkler heads we have on a pivot or you know the 260 heads we have on a golf course. We need to be able to talk and do that consistently. So we're going to optimize this new protocol specifically for us. As we do that, it opens up a lot more opportunities for us. As we have a robotic sprinkler, we have a quad core processor on board, which allows us to do a lot of things. Unfortunately, we're not doing a lot of those things currently because of communication. We'll set a pattern, we'll set a little timer, uh, very simplistic. With this processor now and with communications, we can do diagnostics. So if we have a problem with any of our devices, we can get instant feedback coming back, which is very important for the areas we're in, uh, both on the agricultural pivot. Uh, these pivots, someone may not see these, you know, go out and inspect the pivot operation uh, for a day or two. Uh, in some of our larger fields, you know, especially municipal fields, uh, there's no operator on site and we may not see someone there on, for days or potentially weeks. So it's very important that we have a communication process that works and can get into our sensors at ground level. Uh, Laura's uh, done that. In fact, we had tested it on a new installation we did. Uh, we've installed 1.6 kilometers of sprinklers in a row uh, for dewatering an industrial site. And it's providing absolutely bulletproof, solid communication back and forth that allows us to really optimize our product and increase the commercial commercial ability of it uh, immensely. So our future work, um, Laura, uh, will be ongoing. Uh, we've we believe we're just at the tip of the iceberg with what we're doing with Laura. Uh, it shows great potential to really open up and let us really access all the features of our system. Our predictive control modeling, uh, we're going into the fields this spring. Um, we are going to gather an immense amount of data on a daily basis. Uh, this will allow us to improve and make our model even more efficient. It's very important that we have a very efficient model and can manage our data in real time. And I guess, you know, as it, uh, the other two presenters talked about, we you can get data overload. So it's very important uh, that we work with this model and keep it as efficient as we can, but yet deliver the results that we want. Our remote sensing, uh, currently we're using it just for uh, moisture readings at the plant root level. Again, this is capable of so much more. We wanted to launch this product and get it out there because we believe it's a very important uh, product and can really help with water savings, increase yield and productivity and quality of the field, but it can do so much more. We're gonna be able to look at, at crop health, where we are in the development cycle, if we're starting to see any disease, and we'll see this all in real time so that we can the operator can react to it you know, very quickly and we'll send this all wirelessly using this LoRa technology 
uh, from these remote locations to a central location where it can be viewed frequently and very easily. And then field implementation, again, we're going to, uh, sprinklers now are, have been commercialized uh, we have signed a Canada-wide distribution agreement with EMCO. Uh, they sell our product across Canada now, and we are working on global agreements to increase our sales globally on the sprinkler. Our sensing technology, we are deploying at two golf courses in Alberta on a experimental basis this upcoming season, and we'll be actually taking control of three agricultural pivots in Alberta for this spring. So we're very excited of where this technology is going and looking forward, I think like everybody else to a very exciting 2021. So again, thank you to Alberta Innovates for all their support. I think, you know, all three of our presenters have discussed this. We wouldn't be here without this, uh, without their support. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Anybody listening that hasn't uh, contacted them that are looking at doing research, very much recommend that you do that uh, because their expertise, as Brett alluded to, goes so much farther than the economic benefit you'll get from them. Uh, I would say their contact base and their knowledge base and the support that they give us is much more valuable uh, to the company than the economic consideration. Uh, the economic consideration absolutely helps, uh, but they build your network and they let you build a team. And I think that's what we can be so proud of in Alberta um, is you'll see the, the brain trust that we have and the teams we're able to build that we can create technologies here that don't exist anywhere else in the world. So again, thank you, Alberta Innovates, and thanks for everybody for listening. Okay, um, thank you, Cam, and uh, thank you all the speakers. And so we'll move into a Q&A session right now. So if you haven't already put a question in, um, uh, certainly do so now. I'll uh, moderate and, and pass over some of the questions and I'll promote the questions uh, to the screen so the speakers can see uh, the question that I'm gonna bring forward and, and the audience uh, will see that as well. So just going to... Um, uh, start with the first one here, and so it's uh, directed towards um, uh, Jason and Douglas. And so, uh, uh, Jason Douglas, if you could comment, um, sort of, for, on your first-hand experience, um, um, you know, make some uh, comment on how uh, computing costs are evaluated in the context of applying uh, reinforced learning into the uh, drinking water treatment uh, system process, right? Yeah. And so, you, you indicated the. Uh, the potential for for savings on the uh, on the energy and the chemical side, but are, are, is there a cost associated with doing that, and how does that sort of fit into um, to your overall economics and risk assessment? Great question. Uh, we are still in the process of figuring uh, that out as we continue to develop and test uh, the technology we're working towards. We don't quite yet have a full picture on what that is, but that's a very valid. A very valid point. I, in future updates, we can certainly provide uh, numbers related to that, but I don't have a total answer on that now. Um, how will it affect uh, future water and wastewater treatment? Um, the cost specifically, again, and not sure, but the whole point is to gain efficiencies in the process too. So some of that can be offset with respect to the architecture that you have to build. Um, data storage and transfer, for sure, that's a big thing. Uh, we're working on that right now um, as developing some proprietary right now codes, coding uh, to be able to deal with that. So we do have the, the teams at RLAI and Amy uh, who can help us answer this question, but I apologize. I don't have a direct answer to that right now, but appreciate your interest for sure. Very valid point. Okay. Um, thank you, Jason. Just uh, pushing another one up. Um, can you further clarify how operator intuition and experience uh, captured for the Drayton uh, Valley pilot? So, um. Sure. Um, their input on the pilot design was there for sure. We did sit down and talk to them on several occasions about, uh, hey guys, if you could do this all over again and you could create a system for yourself, what is it would you like 
to see. And so we went after some low hanging fruit and I should add that the data sensing and stuff that we have on there now that I showed on the slides, that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, we went after some kind of low hanging typical type things, but we have made allowances to be able to add more in the future. But that's how we brought them into this is um, we spend a lot of time as ISL in, in Drayton Valley. We know the operators quite well. So they're very frank and open and honest with us about what they would like to know, what they would like to do differently. And that's how we uh, that's how we incorporated it. And you were really asking specifically about operator intuition. Um, <clears throat> that came through in some of the sensing they asked for so um hopefully that answered the question um hey so while this one's up i i, I wanted to add a little bit to it i'm just curious um uh, because um i think D douglas was mentioning uh, maybe it was in his part or yours jason just the the issue of noise right just all the data and it, it initially gets interpreted into noise and i was wondering explicitly if you could indicate um if if you've learned to understand how the system has learned to address noise and as an emerging property and and sort of sift through that so that it starts to look at the the important information that's coming out from that and have have you seen the system sort of self learn how to address the issue of noise to remove filter that out to sort of more focus on on information that's coming to it that it needs to respond to um, no, I'll take this one. Yeah, sure. So on the noise front, I mean, most of our experience uh, that I could share with you now would be with the bench scale system that we were using. Um, we had some vibrations and um, pumping issues going on as the, the small water treatment um, mini plant was working. And this interfered with how the sensors were being picked up by the learning agents. And uh, that, that took a little bit of tweaking, uh, both with uh, postdoc Oma Damaki and also uh, Chava Sespivari. But they, the, the agents were um, obviously put off by some of these uh, initial spikes and you know uh, alternating frequencies and noise and other things coming through signals that were uh, complicated, but but eventually, you know, uh, sitting back with the data and looking at it as a as a researcher, uh, you can glean through that stuff. Now, whether or not this is going to happen uh, on mass with the pilot is another good question, and I think this is what the pathway we're on right now. As we sit here, um, most of what Jason was saying, like the the computing cost of this could turn uh, into uh, a huge a huge issue, but I think in general, what we're doing is taking uh, these decisions that apply to water treatment sequentially and letting letting the learning agent look at uh, piece by piece por portions of the of the process, and we can look at noise within each segment as we go. Um, and um, I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly, but this this is an ongoing issue with any signal processing uh, project, and I, I'm sure uh, there are lots of lo lots of solutions that we could uh, you know go after uh, as we as we see them coming. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. Doug. We we have had many conversations uh, with the researchers. We have uh, obviously regular meetings where we look at various things. Um, they'll put often graphs up on the screen, and you look at a trend in data and trending in in water and wastewater treatments is very important. And the key thing is like, is this data point or spike is it an outlier, or is it a dynamic change in a complex system, and and how do you capture that? So we're working through right now how to how to kind of eliminate odd points and we're still wanting to make sure though that we train the system to be able to capture dynamic jumps and this is uh part of the issue that that uh, doug talked about earlier too about moving from more of a strict or um, model-based approach to more of a model free but um still lessons to be learned on, on that front. Yeah, and just to add, um, we have remote access to the pilot uh, from from the research lab at the University of Alberta, our own home offices. We can also remote into the main facility itself uh, through uh, Suez Water uh, Technologies Insight Program. So we, we have many windows into the system itself. And uh, 
I think in, in general, I think we, we mentioned very quickly model-free uh, reinforcement learning and it, where, where, where model-free reinforcement learning helps is not being hung up on um, existing mathematical models of the process, but actually uh, simply using the data to watch, learn, and, and act and react based on reward systems. And it's very good at dealing with non-stationarity in data sets. Um, and in fact, you know, this is a whole field of research. Uh, we have both discrete and continuous data systems going on in our in our pilot and, and in the main plant. And we spent a whole year letting our research team look at the types of data streams that you see uh, in the plant just so they could be ready and design algorithms to to uh, adapt to that. OK, um, thank you. So I'm going to go to a question um, for Cam here. I'll just uh, push it up to the, uh, to the screen here. And um, so, Cam, um, question was, is there a reason you decided to build a more efficient sprinkler style irrigation um, as opposed to a drip irrigation system? And, and then secondly, if you could uh, comment uh, just on your understanding of, um, you know, the differences in uh, evapotranspor you know, evaporation rates from, from your system, maybe compared to the baseline that you replaced, and then um, uh, also to a, a drip if that was uh, a, a competing technology that you were looking to uh, stand up against. Sure. Um, so we we looked at drip. Drip has certain markets where it uh, fits very well. Um, our climate doesn't lead well to drip, and a lot of climates don't because of breakage in the lines. Um, and then, so we decided to go with with the in ground a traditional uh, sprinkler to do that. We talk about evapotranspiration. We talk about distribution uniformity. One of the recent, one of the things that we found early on in our research was water droplet size is critical. We, the larger the droplet size, up into the point where you don't want to cause damage to your plant or your crop, but the larger the droplet size typically is preferred up to a, a pretty good point because it'll survive evaporation longer and penetrate from the ground, from the surface of the ground into plant root level. So we look at a bunch of different things. So we're looking at, you know, and again, even distribution uniformity, we're trying to keep it very equal, uh, which is one level of efficiency on a, on a product that we rate by. But droplet size has a big key and there is very little research. Uh, it's another research goal for us to look at what's the preferred water droplet size. For now, uh, we know it's a little bit larger. What we try to do with our sprinklers is mimic what we think a, a typical ring droplet size is and just mimic mother nature. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Okay. No. Thank you, Cam. Hey, I was just going to ask um, while you're while you're on here, um, just uh, you know, I know part of your research was you know the one emphasis is you you develop the sprinkler that can water a square, it can water a triangle, um, and it can water a circle. And so you uh, you indicated you know the more recent work where you've moved into the uh, the agriculture setting, and I, I'm just curious. Um, if you've, uh, I haven't had a chance to ask you, if you've sort of focused on the works explicitly putting, you know, one extra big uh, of your um, sprinkler heads on the end of the pivot so that it just turns on when it gets to the corners and and starts to, you know, turn that circle into a bit more of a square to, uh, you know, leverage the, uh, the, the size and shape of your agri average agricultural field as opposed to the area that a pivot normally waters. Yeah, and you know, it's a very timely question. Um, and they call that an end gun, and there will be end guns on, on an agricultural pivot. And if we get into any, what we'll call a money crop or any crop that uh, uh, needs a more even watering, they will 100% of the time turn it off because it doesn't do a very good job. Uh, and then there's also all these environmental concerns now where the typical end gun would spray onto the road uh, and spray into ditches and we're getting some using water that shouldn't leave the site and shouldn't and you can be fined for this type of thing. So our robotic technologies 
along with our wind shift technology to make sure we put the water where we want it, it I think is, is very point on to go onto an end gun. And we have found a research professor at the University of Alberta that uh, I think is, has some, found some very exciting new technology that will let us really push nozzle development so that we can get that gun to go great distances and really cover that because those corners are big. I mean, they're very large areas. Um, everybody, I think, would be familiar with com computational fluid dynamic uh, analysis, CFD. You can do that currently within an enclosed area, but nozzles into an open area. There hasn't been a tool. And there's a tool just come online that will, I think, really speed up nozzle development and allow us to take advantage because you're correct. There's over 20. We can increase the productivity or the land available by 20% just by watering those corners. So our research begins this spring on that. Okay, um, thanks, Cam. So I had one other question, but I was gonna bring it up, but I think, oh no, the person who asked it is, is still here as well. So um, I'll just promote this to, um, to the screen here as well. And uh, so how, how confident uh, can we be on a chlorine residual test versus a back T test? And, um anyone want to comment on that well i can i can start that uh, first of all we have to understand that residual chlorine the absence or presence uh, is irrelevant it's actually the concentration of the residual chlorine that is important and uh, because of the, all the water chemistry and all the conditions of the water that uh, we can have in a pipe and uh, there is a specific range of residual chlorine for each type of municipality that they have to uh, be in their range. And we recently had actually for Edmonton water system, uh, sort of a notice that their residual chlorine was out of the range and they had to fix it. But at the end of the day, back T test is definitely more important. And that is why it is regulated for all the municipalities to do back T tests as opposed to sticking on to residual chlorine. And that's why, as I said, only almost 60% of the municipalities do it with chlorine and 40% only do back tests. Okay. Um, thank you, Amir. So I recognize it's uh, 1230. Normally we uh, intend to schedule uh, to this point. So I'll just highlight to everyone, um, we do uh, record these sessions and uh, we do place them online. So if you uh, came in late, you certainly have a chance to revisit uh, it uh, at some other time. I'd like to thank um, Douglas, uh, Jason, Amir and Cam for um, really interesting presentations and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, to work with you and, and provide you support uh, as you're advancing the technologies that you're doing because it's uh, it's um, it's interesting and exciting work at exciting times. And then also just uh, say thank you to the audience for attending today's session. I hope um, you learned something and it maybe sparked a few new ideas. Um, this is the last of the uh, sessions that we had planned uh, for this year. And we're gonna um, sort of begin planning some uh, new sessions as we move into the new year as well. But we currently uh, don't have that schedule up and running so we'll be sure to push the information out as it uh, as it becomes available so certainly uh, for our speakers for the audience and everyone i'd like to certainly uh, wish uh, everyone um, um, health and happiness as we move into the holiday season this year and looking forward to uh, an interesting and more open uh, 2021 so certainly uh, take care everyone and um, all the best and we'll just sign off for now so thanks a lot